it's just important about empowering all parents to be able to fight for what their kids need. And like you said, helping them walk in their purpose, because what if we just killed the dream? What if we just killed a purpose? You know, we, we know that God will manifest that for us at some point, but it's deferred because we didn't help them through that time that they really needed it. Not because we didn't want to, but just because we didn't understand. Hey family, I'm DNA Clark Jackson, and you're doing Life with Lakeisha on Living Her Truth. Welcome to the Living Her Truth podcast, where we have honest conversations about what it means to live a purpose-driven life. I am your host, Lakeisha Woodard from LakeishaWoodard.com, the place where women receive the tools necessary to feel seen, heard, and supported while pursuing their purpose. And now every week, you'll learn those same tools through candid and transparent conversations. Dijanae, thank you so much for saying yes to having this conversation with me today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. I'm excited. Anytime we sit down and have a conversation about our babies, it makes me excited, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yes. So I love to start off every conversation. We're just talking about how I come to know the person that I'm talking with. And this episode is no different. So Dijanae and I met in a online business group that is wildly, wildly popular. And for all of the reasons that is wildly popular is really, really true. Absolutely love that particular business group. And so within that business group, the income strategist that created, you know, the business group, like niched us down into even smaller groups. And so DJ and I are a part of that niche down smaller group in the months of the big business group, if that makes any sense. Hopefully you guys are rocking with me right then and there. So needless to say, Dijanae and I are accountability partners. And so we have gotten the chance to know each other. We're in a group with eight other amazing women. And so after this particular group ended, we just continue with the accountability group because we just mesh and we love each other, like truly love each other, I feel like. And we just been rocking with each other ever since then. And so now I got on a podcast because she does something amazing and we're going to talk about it on today. So, and, and thank you so much. And yes, we do amazing things, right? So yeah. I just want to make that clear. And, and by divine intervention and intentional placement, we were placed together and we are truly a circle of supportive women. So we appreciate that. I appreciate you for being our group's leader. <laughs> That's right, because I was the leader. And, and leader. I was shocked. <laughs> and I was shocked. I was like, what? Okay. If that's what y'all want me to do, I step up to the child because that's what I do, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what you do. But yeah, but no, it's it's an amazing group. And we, you know, ended up continuing the group even right now to this day. We still continue yeah. with the group. And it's just amazing because being a part of this accountability group has really just helped me to even do some of the scarier things that I have set up and lined up for myself. And I'm pretty sure you can say the same, right, Dijanae? Yes. And it, like I said, it's a huge network of support, a small network small of huge network. support. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. So speaking of what you do, educational therapists, explain to us, what is that exactly? Well, I'm glad you asked. So I get that a lot, right? People know the area of education mm-hmm. really and truly when they think about a therapist, what comes to mind is a mental health therapist. Um, but what an educational therapist is is a highly trained professional and we come from very background highly trained professionals that um really address individually address from a therapeutic standpoint Mm -hmm. uh kids in particular it depends on their um that particular therapist's range of of treatment patients or clients um but using a therapeutic approach to addressing the educational needs of that student and just like um, a medical practice Mm -hmm. Each therapist has different specialties. And for me, my specialty is ADHD and dyslexia. So I specifically Mm -hmm. work with that set of um, students with those learning challenges. And so, yeah, it's, 
it is not a um, a thing that most people know about that's mm -hmm. available. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's not available in school systems. We are private practice uh, practitioners. So yeah, but we exist. And it's important for, for students to, to have that individual attention from a therapeutic standpoint. Mm -hmm. I 100%, I 100% agree. You know, I, I truly believe in, and I teach in my coaching practices, like a holistic approach, you know, to chasing purpose. And one part of that is making sure your foundation is together and your foundation, a part of your foundation are, you know, is your kids, your family, right? Especially mm -hmm. if you are a mom. Um, last week I sat down and I talked to Haley and Grace. Haley is a teenage entrepreneur here in Houston. And I had her mom on a podcast as well, because I want to talk to her about, you know, how sometimes we can live vicariously through our children instead of pursuing our own purpose. We will live vicariously through our children. And, you know, we are in doing that, we are blocking our child from actually uh, pursuing their purpose, because I truly mm -hmm. believe that each and every one of us has a specific purpose and a calling on our life. So, you know, I figure let's continue this conversation because it's important to not only operate in our purpose and give our children the space and the grace to really get clear on their purpose and operate in their purpose, but to mm -hmm. also to advocate for them. We have to yeah. be our biggest, you know, our children's biggest advocate until they're old enough to really, you know, truly step into that role themselves. So educational therapist, that seems like, you know, a really, really specific area, a specific field, if you will. It's not generalized <laughs> like psychotherapists, yes. right? It's very yes. specific. So, you know, how, how exactly did you get into that particular field? So I didn't set out to be an educational therapist. Mm -hmm. I set out to do various things and <laughs> like all life's paths, right. they take, you know, ebbs and flows and takes twists and turns. And so um, after finishing undergrad, I got a master's in school counseling. And so I was going to work in the school system. But in the meantime of finding a school counselor kind of area to get into, I went and became a teacher. Um, feeling like we really needed to understand the perspective of teachers, of the whole system, instead of just jumping into a school counselor role. Mm -hmm. And so I was a classroom teacher. I was then a school counselor. Um, and prior to that, I worked on a university level. So I've worked with mm -hmm. kids from, you know, early childhood all the way through, you know, college matriculation. But my personal story is that my son, my oldest son, I have two, my oldest son had some learning challenges and I noticed something was off early on, but didn't quite understand what exactly it was. And you really didn't have guidance from the educational professionals to really tell me what was going on with him. So we um, fast forward to third grade. This was from kindergarten. The fast forward to third grade, he was mm -hmm. failing. I was frustrated. He was exhausted. I mean, it was just a really bad environment. And being a professional, being a counselor, being a teacher, I knew that, that had, there had to be something else that we didn't catch. So I had him screen for dyslexia and his dyslexia screening came back high risk. So he was mildly at risk for dyslexia. And on top of that, we learned of his ADHD diagnosis. So all of this came oh. at the same time. Mm -hmm. But what was the turning point for us was when we met with the school, to discuss what do we do with this information, right? Diagnosis is only one thing. The mm -hmm. intervention to follow is really where the student gets the help. Well, unfortunately, our school and our school system and our state for that matter had nothing, nothing, did not have a thing, right? Yes, wow. to offer my child who has had all of these struggles for all of this time. And so, you know, I'm mama bear like so many of us are, right? And so I decided that if the teachers didn't, and they were so great, they were well-intended school staff, they just didn't have the resources or the knowledge base to be able to tell me what to do or to, um, for themselves, do what they needed to do for him. And so I went back to school. I said, if you don't know, I'll find out for myself. So I really okay, Mama Bear. I needed another degree, like a hole in my head. Trust me, I didn't. I was not setting out to do that. So 
I earned the math and now the master's in, in dyslexia therapy. So when we combined my dyslexia therapy area for it, that's the, the education part in my classroom, early childhood certification, and combined that with my counseling, that created an educational therapist. And so through my educational therapist mm -hmm. um, practice, I am first and foremost an advocate for kids with all learning disabilities, but specifically yeah. with ADHD and dyslexia, and ensuring that the schools have the tools to do what they need to do to address these students' concerns, and that parents, specifically parents, especially moms, mm -hmm. empower themselves with the knowledge that they need to advocate for their kids and raise their kids to be self-advocates, because that's so important. So. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so, Let's take a moment for you to explain dyslexia. What exactly, what exactly it is? What does that mean? Because, you know, my first encounter with dyslexia, you guys don't laugh at me, was the Cosby show when Theo had a learning challenge and was diagnosed with, with dyslexia. Like that was my first encounter or introduction to, you know, this thing called dyslexia. So I really don't quite know and understand what it is so it may be foreign to a lot of people as well so break down tell us what exactly is dyslexia and i'm gonna have to look that up because i did not know that episode existed yes and so I am gonna please do Theo. I would yes. love, because that that speaks and before i answer that question that speaks so much to our community mm -hmm. and the fact that dyslexia isn't spoken a lot in our community because mm -hmm. it's not widely known across you know all areas all communities but particularly you know the african-american community with getting diagnosis advocating for their kids to get help and understanding the school system as a whole and what avenues they need to go through to ensure that they get help mm -hmm. but dyslexia has i always start with when people say what is dyslexia i always go with well, dyslexia is not because what, what has happened is so, there's been so many myths that have been perpetuated about dyslexia and not to anyone's fault, but it's just something that's been passed along. So mm -hmm. I like to always start with dyslexia is not a visual problem. It is not that dyslexic see letters backwards because a lot of parents, and I will filter and answer all questions because no questions are dumb questions every question should lead to you know wider knowledge right and so it's not a visual problem it's not just writing b and d backwards or p and q those are some developmentally appropriate things that we look at there are early learning signs that we have parents look for when deciding whether or not it is or it is not but with dyslexia is since we know that it's not a visual problem of writing letters backwards it's um, a neurological disorder that the person who is trying to read has a disconnect with letter, the print letter and sound. So mm -hmm. that in turn, when it, someone says, my kid wrote the word backwards or made up some other letters or guessed at something when they were reading, it's because they didn't connect the phonological sound to the print. So that may look very different for, for a lot of people, but it's not just about reading, it covers spelling and writing. And um, dyslexia, like a lot of disorders, are is a spectrum. So you can be on the very mild end to the very severe profound end. And dyslexia may look differently in a lot of people. They, dyslexic students even have problems with recall. Just in a conversation, you know, you can't quite grab the word it's not like your average everyday thing because we have to talk about what's above and beyond the norm, right? And so trying to pull or grab that word and can't quite recall, that's all part of being dyslexic, you know, mm. being a dyslexic person. So, um, and I try and use people first term. So um, people with dyslexia have a lot of challenges, but the big thing is that they can learn to overcome those things if they are appropriately instructed, accommodated, you know, addressed in school so that they don't have to grow up to be, you know, reluctant adults with dyslexia. Because dyslexia doesn't go away. You just learn to, to cope with those um, signs and symptoms. But what we don't want to do is raise 
you know, bitter, reluctant adults who have dyslexia? You know, um, I think what you said is so profound. The fact that dyslexia is not something that you can actually see. You know, when you said that, it just made me go back to when I was younger, you know, because by it not being something that's commonly talked about in the African-American community, you know, we don't know it exists. And the fact that even right now today, some schools don't even have the proper tools to even diagnose, let alone treat a child um, who has dyslexia. So I'm just sitting here thinking about like when I was smaller, you know, because, you know, I'm not dyslexic, but what if I was? I like, I can see my mom saying, you know, you just need to study harder. Like, pay attention in school, you know? Yeah. But the fact that you took the time with your child to say, okay, let's, let me look into this deeper, because what's really going on? Like, what is the underlining, you know, what's the underlining cause? And that, you know, requires really being, um, in tune and present in the moment and really aware of what's going on with your child because I can see how that can be as a child can be really frustrating because if, if the grown-ups don't even know what dyslex dyslexia is how the heck is the child able to communicate what's going on <laughs> exactly <laughs> right? exactly and so, they get frustrated and they their whole outlook on school is been completely skewed mm -hmm. and so now a child who's in first grade has 11 more years, right, to, to hate school and every part of it. And so it brings out things like anxiety, depression, mm. like it's a snowball of things if we don't address it. And you spoke to something so vital, um, which we touched on with, with discussing it in the African American community, because we think that our kids are just not doing enough, mm -hmm. right, as opposed mm -hmm. to other communities that say, well, the school must not be doing enough. And we tend to put that pressure on ourselves, not giving our kids the, the understanding and the opportunity to be okay that you have done your best. Mm -hmm. Now let's move on to something else to see how we can put your best with their best to mm -hmm. create, you know, a harmonious situation for your educational journey. And here's, a, here's one of the, the talks among the educational professionals in this realm is that um, they like to say that dyslexia is a rich person's problem. Really? Because, because, and, and I've worked with students and parents and families across, you know, from low SES, you know, to, to mansion owners. So I understand that. And here's why it said, because if you are a poor kid with dyslexia, you just need to try harder, get medicated, and figure it out. But if you are an affluent person with dyslexia, the school needs to do more, the parents will get private help, and you will fight for what your kid is entitled to, especially we're talking public school systems. So even though you could have this two of the, those students in the same school, the approach to their situation can look very different, especially if the professionals aren't versed in what it is that the problem is. And so I not only advocate for those who can afford to pay for private practice service, but for those who are entitled to it, just because they're on the low SES and does not mean that their services should be any less than those who can afford private services. Mm. And that's the downfall of, of a lot of our public school system. That's so crazy. it's sad. That's why we have to empower parents. And so many parents are so discouraged, especially if we're talking about the low SES. There's, and I'm, I'm sorry, let me back up. This is what happens, right? With educational professionals and professionals of, of your field, we talk in acronyms. So when I say- Because I was just about to say, what is SES? Socioeconomic <laughs> status. So your, your kids that are in poverty, your kids that even for our middle class, because these days, we can't afford, even in the middle class, um, to have therapy privately. You know, if it's not mm -hmm. covered by insurance, mm -hmm. if it's not covered by, you know, some form of, of assistance, whether you're paying for it or government assistance, which this is not, then you are left to fend for yourself. So we have to empower those parents. But then we have the concern that we have parents who may not get everything that's going on. So 
there should be advocates out there to walk those parents through the process. So even though they don't have, you know, 12 master's degrees and, and are a, a, a surgeon, that they still have the same rights and same access to information that, you know, the surgeon does. And now speaking on the surgeon, they might be very well versed in running the operating room, but have no idea, no clue of what we're talking about in the conference room of a, of a school IEP meeting or, you know, mm -hmm. I, an individualized education program. So um, it's just important about empowering all parents to be able to fight for what their kids need. And like you said, helping them walk in their purpose, because what if we just killed the dream? What if we just killed a purpose? You know, we, we know that God will manifest that for us at some point, but it's deferred because we didn't help them through that time that they really needed it. Not because we didn't want to, but just because we didn't understand. And not every parent has the ability to say, I'm going to go back to school and learn it from the inside out so that I can help my kid. And that, which is what I did not to only help mine, but help all the other, because I was a part of that problem and process. So I kind of was righting my wrongs, you know, through this process. And, um, you know, we just, parents really need to be empowered and motivated and, you know, living their purpose as a parent to be able to help their kids. Wow. I never heard that dyslexia is a rich person's, is a rich person's problem. That, 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 oh my goodness, that's, that's just crazy. But, you know, I think the, the first thing that we need to understand, not just as parents, but as a people, is that just because you're dyslexic or your child is dyslexic, it does not mean that your child or you are dumb. Right. Let's get that, let's get that clear. Amen. And clear the air. That it does yeah. not mean that you, that you are dumb. So let's take that stigma from it because we're not going to, because first off, therapy I'm doing air quotes for those who can't see me, <laughs> already <laughs> has a stigma on it. So to go to therapy for something like dyslexia, let's clear the air of that. Just because you're dyslexic doesn't mean that you're dumb. Let's clear the air. And so let's, you know, move past the stigma and get the help that we need because, you know, therapy is covered by some insurances, you know, and if you are fortunate enough to have that insurance, this is definitely something that you should, um, um, take advantage of right to to help your child because how you approach the situation is going I feel as though it's going to set the foundation for how your child approach the situation because if you come at your child as if you know oh well you're dumb and you're stupid because you you have dyslexia then your child is going to take on that perception that notion that idea about themselves and then that can defer their purpose as well because Absolutely. it doesn't mean that you know, that they're, that they are dumb, but you know, for the parents who are unaware, don't know what this is. And, you know, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm still thinking about my mom, you know, because I grew up on welfare. My mom never graduated from, from high school. So thankfully me and my sisters and brothers, we, you know, none of us was um, diagnosed with dyslexia. Um, but like, I can't even imagine how my mom would have possibly felt if she had enough courage to go and speak on our behalf because she wouldn't know what to say how to say it you know they probably would have been like talking over our heads i have a master's degree and i was about to ask you what what is ses <laughs> exactly <laughs> you know what i'm saying so let's talk to the parents who have children that's diagnosed with dyslexia or possibly you know um it's possible dyslexic but they just haven't gotten a diagnosis just yet so let's talk to them for a minute who may be feeling intimidated to have this conversation, right? How can these parents prepare themselves and feel more confident to have this conversation so they can, you know, be an advocate for their child so a child can get the help that they need? So um, aside from parents immersing themselves in everything that they can about their kid's specific mm -hmm. problem, mm -hmm. what happens if you have a parent that may not quite know where to start mm -hmm. to even look for information. Mm -hmm. And the best place to start, which it's not the only place, but the best place to start would be in your child's school because you are going to be called into a ton of meetings, right? And it's so intimidating. Can you imagine 
being in a foreign country where you are the only person in the room and you need something, but everyone is speaking a foreign language and you have no clue if they understand you because you certainly don't understand them. That is how some of our parents feel at this table. And let me tell you what this table looks like. It can be up to eight people and a parent. So how intimidating could that be to someone who like, like your mom, who may not have the educational background and confidence to walk into a meeting like that, feeling like they can talk about what their kid needs because they may not even know what their kid needs. And so what I tell, what I say to those parents is ask questions, ask a ton of questions. And a lot of times schools, their times are so limited. It's okay to extend a meeting. It's okay to say, let's reconvene give me another date, you know, let's come back to the table on this. If something is said and you don't understand, ask for clarification. Ask them to say it again in a different way. Ask them to use a different term. Ask them where I can find that information because we so much rely on the educational professionals to have all the answers, to be the end all be all to what you're entitled to, what they are willing to offer, um, and we don't necessarily give them the same rights that we would give like someone in the, the medical field. And I always, I always use medical um, as an analogy because for me, as a mom of kids who are always at the doctor, and um, it, it's so much more relatable because everybody has to go to the doctor, right? And so everybody yeah. pretty much understands that, that medical analogy. But for in our medical field, we have something called malpractice. Right, if a doctor, facility, agency does not fulfill their right, your their duty, according with your rights, you can sue. But we don't have malpractice in education, right? Because if we did, we have some broke school system. Um, <laughs> because it puts people at an accountability level that they can't even fathom, right? We have all of these laws and policies, but no one is accountable. But I say that because. It is your right as a parent who is speaking on behalf of your child because it's your child's right, but it's the parent who enacts those rights for your child. Mm -hmm. It is so important for you to have so much because you talk about clarity, you talk about, you know, vision. It's so important for you to have all of the knowledge, all of the clarity when you leave that meeting. And so you'll know what direction to go in. You'll know what direction the school is going in. And just being able to have that knowledge base they can then start having those conversations with their kids to say, this is what we're dealing with at school. And asking our kids how they feel about that. How do you feel about this particular label? How do you feel about what may follow? What are your thoughts? What is it that you need? Because I'd say that, and this is the difference between, you know, a, a tutor and a therapist sort of thing. Our educational therapists take that approach. We take the time to say, what is, what is it that you need? Because so often there are these adults making decisions yeah. for our little people and no one ever asks them what they need, uh, what they would like, yeah. you know, what they wouldn't like. Mm -hmm. And we're doing it with all the best intentions. But oftentimes, if we just take a step back, breathe a little bit, get over our issues our adult egos and focus on the child then we can accomplish much more in that respect so i would say to those parents just get your clarity before you leave that table and if you don't have clarity come back to the table you don't have to make any decisions at that time i know that's right come back to, and then come back to the table as many times as you need to come back to the table let's start there <laughs> And, and and also to the moms out there too, you know, don't um, skip over the fact that Dijon they said that you know the school systems are are just now learning about dyslexia, so don't feel intimidated because you think that they know all the answers or they just high up on this 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 totem pole because they probably know just as much as you do. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Not a thing. You know, this is a uh, you know dyslexia is an area that we all need to get educated more on. You know, because even with 
um, you know, Dijanae, she has multiple degrees and she still goes into her meetings, you know, super prepared. I know because I saw her live on Facebook where she showed <laughs> her book. Do you have your book? I was going to say, I tell my, my parents, be a binder bringing parent. If you look and, and I tell them, I am going through this with you. What is that called? The, the beast. beast. That is my kids educational documentation and I am serious about empowering every parent you might not be a five inch binder you might have to three I might start you off with a two or three but eventually you may two end up with a five inch binder and I tell you the impact you I mean you wouldn't even believe the impact that that would have on a meeting because you came prepared mm -hmm. and whatever it is that they're throwing at you because it comes quick. You can go and flip to that section and go, well, according to, cause they're not ready. <laughs> they are not ready. You guys, you guys got to go and check out the, uh, the video on facebook.com forward slash living her truth. So you can see the beast <laughs> cause it's a, because it is a beast. And, you know, coming into a meeting where prepared like this, that also let, you know, the educators or, who, or whomever you're sitting across know that you mean business and you're not the one to be tried. And that's, and that's not just in this scenario. This is any scenario in your life, no matter what meeting you're going to. It could be a meeting that you're going into with your boss to talk about your raise that you haven't got in the last three years. Girl, you better go in there with your binder. This is everything that I've done. These are all the accomplishments. This is how much money I didn't raise for this company. You know, all of this, you know, so they can know that, okay, this woman means, or this man means business. So let's not play around here. And we're going to sit here and we're we going to take them seriously. It's just all about being prepared. And just imagine the, the, just imagine the example you are being for your child because your child sees this. And they are soaking this in and they're internalizing it themselves. And then they're going to go and do it in their own life because we have to be an example for our kids as well on what it means and what it looks like to advocate for ourselves. Absolutely. Right? And that, that is important. Like you said, it's about being prepared and by being prepared, you're mm -hmm. knowledgeable. You've made yourself knowledgeable of all that you need to know in order to be prepared. And let me say this because <laughs> I don't want to get, from my wonderful, amazing professionals in education. Shout out to my school counselors, my principals. We love you. But what this does is it lets you know that we're present, that we are active. Because a lot of the times they think parents are passive participants. We are active participants in our children's educational journey. And so, and I, we had talked about my, one of my lives that I did um, not too long ago where I had to attend my child's IEP meeting. And I went, you know, like we, like most of the parents who have had to fight for their kids' educational accommodations and accessible, uh, accessibility in school, I went with, you know, the full armor of God, honey. <laughs> I went ready <laughs> for battle. But in that process, realizing that I had some allies at the table, that, but I was open to receiving, because you talk about being open to receive things in your morning mantra. So I was open to receive some feedback. I wasn't, I didn't put up a wall. I wasn't a barrier, but I wasn't going to back down either from what I knew to be what the focus should have been. Mm -hmm. So leaving that meeting, I was happy about the outcome, but really relieved that I had, knowing that I had some allies. So we have to keep that in mind too, that not every school professional doesn't care, doesn't, isn't aware, um, because dyslexia has been around for, since the 1800s. Like it's nothing new. We are just now, have, like everything is a movement right now. It's, we're, we're moving the needle, right? And so there are some that are open to receiving the information, but just prepare yourself, you know, for, like I say, prepare for the worst, you know, expect the best, something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's what we need to do going into those meetings. But a lot of the educational professionals, it's not that they don't care. They just don't know how to care, you know, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, it does make sense. And and you're right. So I'm glad you cleared the air on that too, because we don't want to be, you know, bashing the education system, right? But um and, and then I also think that when, when parents come to a meeting and prepare and 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 fully um ready to work with the education system, it kind of gives them um a, a pep a pep boost, if you will, that kind of gives them a, a edge or something to to stand on. Because a lot of times they're probably feeling like the parents don't care. And if the parents would just be a little bit more active, maybe they can get some things done. Because depending on who you're talking to, they're probably not even in a position to even, you know, move the needle. But if they are have the parents rally behind them or standing next to them, and we both going in, you know, to talk to whomever above, you know, that makes those decisions, it can be, it can be life-changing, you know, for, for your child and the school system overall yeah absolutely so i love that i love that so how is your son doing now because um, you found this out in, in the kin- in kindergarten right in third grade he third had grade. his and here's the thing not every kid needs a diagnosis a formal diagnosis you just have to have the care to win hmm. dyslexia so i really i i push that so they're not going to get a dyslexic diagnosis in the school system. They'll have to pay for that privately, oh. but just that they just have to have the characteristic of talk about that socioeconomic pendulum. It's side of those can't afford to have that outside evaluation because if you look at their data, it may tell you that based on what we're looking at they more than likely would have dyslexia or it mirrors what dyslexia is. So I want to make sure all of our parents know that they just have to have those characteristics. So when you have a kid who has learning challenges, mind you, mine has dyslexia and ADHD. He has given me all the permissions to tell his story. He loves when I mention him, hi Noah, and, and I can't leave out Nick, that's my baby. Um, he has given me all the permission because I discussed this with him. He knows his challenges. He Mm -hmm. is learning. He's in sixth grade now. So we got that checklist diagnosis in third grade. He's in sixth now. And every day is a challenge. Mm -hmm. And I want to let my parents know that just because you have a diagnosis doesn't mean that the work stops. You continue the work every day. You check in with your kid all the time to see how those things are going. This is not a set it and forget it type of situation. Once I get diagnosed, great, I'm good. Because every year at the beginning, and here's the thing that I, I'm, I'm telling on myself, but so for those future teachers he has, at the beginning of every year, it, within the first week of school, I schedule a parent-teacher conference with all the teachers. Because what, I, what that does is it sets the stage for how we are going to behave for the rest of the year. Now, when I say behave, I mean the uh, relationship that I will create with those teachers because building relationships, um, especially when you have someone who's your child's education, I have those meetings to set the groundwork, to set the framework for I want to introduce them to who he is as a person, not as one among them and I know they can't really hone in on every student but I should know mine and so if parents that their kids have some problematic situations that they know are going to come up be proactive let's meet with them before anything happens because teachers don't necessarily parent teacher conferences but they appreciate the fact that parents what is it that your child may need in the future? You know, what am I looking at for this particular student? What am I looking for, for those things that I need to with a parent? And what that does is it lets those teachers know that I am here, that I am a participant, like I said before, in my child's educational journey. So please, I'm reaching out to you so that you know to reach out to me if ever there's a problem. And that's important. That is important up front, but every day is a check-in, check-out sort of situation because, like I said, dyslexic. And he is he is mild on the dyslexic end and severe on our ADHD spectrum. So it's it's 
thank God for that though, because Lord knows if we were on both on the if we were playing seesaw and <laughs> I I can't do it. But thankfully we are we're a little balanced in that respect. <laughs> You are too, you are too funny. Um, I love the fact that you said that, you know, you don't have to have an official diagnosis. Well, do you need an official diagnosis in order to um, like use your medical benefits to, to get the therapy that's needed to help with the dyslexia if you don't have an official diagnosis? So coverage, unlike mental health therapy, educational therapy, dyslexia therapy, um, is typically not covered by insurance. That's why we talk about it being a rich person who can afford it can get the intervention. Okay. Offer that. So we're going to pause for a moment and then I'm going to ask you that question again. Okay, is it, could it be me? It's not my earbuds, is it? I don't know. It may be the Wi Fi. I don't know. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you that last question again. So you mentioned that you don't have to have an official diagnosis, right? Uh, for for dyslexia. Well, if we don't have official diagnosis, would that affect someone being able to use their their medical coverage to you know to get the therapy that's needed to help with the dyslexia? So unfortunately, unlike mental health therapy. Um, the educational therapy, dyslexia therapy, isn't typically typically covered by medical insurance, and that's a whole different fight for a whole different decade. Um, other therapies like occupational therapy or speech therapy, it's really an unfair um, balance. In yes, in the medical field, just dyslexia is a neurological disorder, so why doesn't it fall under medical for medical? But yeah, unfortunately, therapy for education falls under the educational umbrella and not the medical. So there are some, though, some private insurances may cover it to a certain extent, but mostly it will not be covered. Wow. Okay, but you but moms out there, don't let that discourage you from um, getting your your child the help that he or she he or she needs. So, um, with that being said, so how can a mom know? Like, what are some of the signs that their child is dyslexic? Yeah, so that's a good question. There are stages of development, just like your physical development. When they talk about kids should be talking, crawling, and walking there are developmental signs for speaking, listening, writing, reading. Um, and so it take, if we're talking about a kindergartner, for example, kindergarten, first grade, some of the red flags that we would look for would be in those, in those kids would be rhyming. And I always use rhyming as a huge thing because remember we talk about that connection between phonics, right? That phonics instruction. Mm -hmm. If they don't recognize rhyming words, like if they don't know basic cat and hat are rhyming words because they sound the same, um, then we will that indicator that there may be some, some, if by second grade, they're still writing letters backwards, words with letters within the words, then we think about, okay, how is your brain processing where those sounds belong words? Um, so those are just some early indicators. There's a whole list of them um, that I offer um, in various forms. And you can literally use it as a checklist to see, you know, is this my kid? Is this my kid? You know, and, and observe them. A lot of times parents, we read to our kids. We don't often have them read to us. Yeah. Sometimes in school is the only time that they read aloud. And trust me, if they have dyslexia, they're not trying to read a lot in school. They're, they're using avoidance at some point. So my parents, if your kids have behavior problems, don't just look at the behavior. Look at the causation of the behavior. And sometimes it's avoidance because they have learning challenges. Um, and so have your kids read to you at home on an on a age-appropriate level book. 
and you can then observe where their challenges are. So I, I just tell parents, just kind of get into it, become a teacher for a second so that you can observe and analyze your, your kids for yourself. Mm -hmm. I love that. And you know, that's a really good point because we do read to our kids a lot without necessarily allowing them to, to read to us. You know, that's, that's a really good point. And that's something that that's another reason why we just need to really be present and in the moment with our child, because we don't want somebody to just immediately put them on some type of medication either. I'm almost anti-medication, <laughs> almost anti-medication because I feel like, you know, you guys know, I don't have children, but I have nieces and nephews, a whole ton of them. And it irks me that as soon as a child have a behavior issue, they want to immediately put them on some type of, of medication. That that's just that that irks me really, really bad. Cause I'm because like you said, let's get to the root cause of of the problem. Right? Yes. Let's, let's get to the root cause. Everything doesn't have to be answered with medication. And listen. This, let me drop this this in the pot while we cooking. Okay. Schools are not legally legally schools cannot recommend medicating your child as an intervention for their behavior, their challenges. So schools may be creative in how they offer that advice, but just know if you walk into a meeting and your teacher administrators are blatant about your kid has this problem you need to get them on medicine let me tell you that's a red flag and we need to to document it and file a complaint as soon as possible mm. okay you guys hear that rewind that and listen to it again. <laughs> you need to file a complaint as soon as as soon as possible. So you guys are probably wondering, you know, how does this whole conversation we had today tie back into, you know, living our own our own purpose? And I go back to foundation because when things are running smoothly in your house, because if you have a problem child at home, air quotes problem child, you know, at home it's hard for you to to concentrate and to really, you know, tap into um your own, you know, joys, aspirations, inspirations to, you know, so that's, that you need to tap into in order to fully embrace and operate in your purpose. That's why it's important to take care of home. Home is a part of that foundation. So just really understanding um, what's going on with our children helps us you know, overall, you know, have a clearer, a clearer mind, the less stress, the frustration, anxiety, so we can operate in our purpose. Because when mom is all together, everybody else is all together. When dad is all together, then everybody else can be, you know, all together. But it's, it's, it's all of the moving parts that we have to pay attention to and put together in order to make that happen. And I think that a lot of us, when we are, you know, uh, chasing purpose, if you will, we don't look at all the areas of our life or we don't mentally make the, the connection that mm -hmm. all areas of our life are affected by our purpose and can affect our purpose, right? So that's the reason why we're having this, this conversation because it's a part of our foundation because you have to have a strong foundation to stand on in order for you to go out into this world and, you know, move past all of the judgment that comes at you, you know, in society. It's easier for you to do that when your foundation is sturdy and together. That's the reason why we're having this conversation. That's the reason why it's so important that we are advocating for our children in order for us to be able to advocate for, for ourselves. So with that being said, you know, Dijanae, how can we use self-awareness to become the best advocate for our children? And I love that, using self-awareness to become advocates for our kids. So it starts with us using, be, and, and when we talk about the awareness, that just means knowledge of, I know myself. Oftentimes, we don't know ourselves. So how can we truly understand the plights of our kids because sometimes we hadn't even accepted our truth, right? Because our kids, they're, the statistics, I'm not sure of the specific statistics, but with dyslexia specifically, 
after kids are diagnosed, parents get diagnosed because dyslexia is hereditary. And so oftentimes, when we are going through this evaluation process for the kids, the parents see themselves in the results of those evaluations and thereby accepting their own truth in diagnosis and saying, now I know what my issues were. So then now that I'm more self-aware, I can then make my child self-aware and we can advocate for their needs. So I think in, in this sense, it's amazing that, you know, you talk about living your truth and being, um, you know, finding your purpose. And a lot of times it's important for parents to be aware of their own situation so that they can then advocate for their kids because we want to raise self advocates. Mm -hmm. And by that, they'll be self aware. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you guys, those who are, who are listening, if you need help with really, you know, taking that self-awareness and turning around and using it as a tool that I need you to go to LakeishaWooder.com forward slash coaching, because I can help you with that. That's what my business is, is all about. That's the reason for this podcast, because self-awareness is so crucial. I feel like with everything, you know, because with me, my journey to purpose started with me becoming more self-aware. I needed to know who is Lakeisha Smith? Who, who is she? Right. And so that's what helped me to really um, heal and just grow into the person that I was called to, to become period, you know, so self-awareness is key. So if you need help with, you know, becoming more self-aware so you can teach and be an example of what um, self-awareness is to your children and go to LakeishaWooder.com forward slash coaching. Dijanae, girl, you are the bomb.com, honey. You are the bomb.com. <laughs> because the I am I am in good company. That's why. <laughs> okay, okay. I take that. I receive that. I receive that. <laughs> but before I let you go, give us a, a book recommendation or audible recommendation. Um, because y'all know how I feel about Audible. I love me some Audible. But give us a, a book or audible recommendation that has changed your life. Okay, so I this this works for everybody. So I want you to I want every all of your listeners to be open to receiving this. Okay. okay this audible book. Okay. And I think you should get it in print version because I'm an audible book um fanatic also. The book is called Wait for It. Oh the places you'll go by Dr. Seuss. <laughs> listen, listen, don't laugh. It is everything. It is what? everything. Listen. Say that again for the people in the background because the people okay, on, their, so, on, their, on, their, on their phones probably turn up the volume like, did she say Dr. Seuss? I did. She said Dr. Seuss. Oh, the places you'll go by Dr. Seuss. It is an amazing, and, and we talk about, you know, of course I'm early childhood. I mean, I like growing up books too, but this is a book that will help you. And I think it'll help your listeners. And um, especially when they're working with you with coaching to find your purpose and to give yourself permission to stumble in life and to find out how to navigate, hello, somebody, navigate yourself through those tough, choppy waters. Y'all, it is a kid's book. And I read it to my kids all the time. I've read it to my class, my students, my clients, and it works for everyone. Because even as an adult, I need to read that sometimes. You get you I guess sometimes we need it to be broken down on an elementary level, no pun intended, in order to really get the message because, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, you know, I'm glad you gave us that book because, you know, sometimes we make things more difficult than what it really is. Like, for instance, our purpose. We think our purpose is something that's this gigantic, enormous, beautiful, audacious thing, and it could be something as simple as dog walking. That's our purpose. Lip live in it, walk in it. You can be the best dog walker. Hello. Run circles around all the dogs. Hello, Caesar. Caesar Milan. Can, can we, can we, I'm just saying, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying. So sometimes we need to look at the, the small things, right? Because we think that we don't know what our purpose is and we do, it's right in front of us. But because it's so simple, you know, we, we bypass it or we overlook it. So, you know, that's a good book recommendation. See that girl, that's why I like you because you challenging us. You challenging us. <laughs> 
And okay. I, want to, I want young listeners to, to reach out to you to tell you, you, yes. you're going to have to give me a Twitter handle to let you know and go on Facebook to let you know how the book was and what that book did for them in their current situation to be able to either live their truth or find their purpose. Absolutely. You guys tweet me, Lakeisha Woodard, Facebook, living her truth, facebook.com forward slash living her truth or facebook.com forward slash Lakeisha Woodard. Yeah. Cause I, I want to know. I'm going to, I'm going to read the book too, no, but I'm gonna probably going to get it on audible though. Yeah. <laughs> I'm probably going to get it on audible because I know my husband, Jerry going to be like, Oh, so are you, are you buying that for Kingsley? Cause you know, we got like four God babies and I'm like, uh, no, maybe no. So I may have to get that. I may have to get that on audible. <laughs> <laughs> no, last question. When describing the meaning of living your truth, what is your third word when you hear these two words I'm about to give to you? Okay. Self awareness, purpose, and what's your third word? Self awareness, mm -hmm. purpose, mm -hmm. and advocacy. Mm -hmm. Because everything I do, I am speaking to and through whatever my purpose, right? So tell me those first two words. Self-awareness, purpose. So when, when I am advocating, it's because I have a sense of self-awareness, mm. right? And in your purpose, you're advocating to fulfill whatever that purpose is, right? Because you're not going to let anybody tell you no. Yeah. You're not going to let those barriers stop you. So I love those two words, and I will throw in advocacy. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Because self-awareness plus purpose can equal advocacy, you know, because I feel like I am advocating for the best version of you. That's the reason why I share my story, because I'm advocating for that. So you're, so you're right. I love that. And I would, I would even go further in saying advocacy plus self-awareness equals purpose. Equal purpose. Ready? Yes. Yeah. We, we don't have to tweet that one. I will do that. You have to tweet that. Y'all see why I had her on the show? <laughs> I had her on the show. <laughs> you are amazing. Thank you so much for this conversation. I'm, I'm pretty sure you have set a lot of moms and aunties free because even though you know you may not have any kids you may know somebody support that parent who has you know that child so thank you for educating us so now i know how to you know support my friends whose child is is dyslexic so thank, thank you, you so that. much thank you for having me i have truly enjoyed this and of course if anybody needs to find out anything more you can go to Learning Fundamentals Educational Therapy and Consulting on Facebook because I want to empower you to be uh, an advocate for your kids.